Um, so if you let me, I start just a, uh, just a brief introductory note about you that Derek Parsley um, is an Australian philosopher and professor of philosophy at the University of Tasmania. Uh, he's known for his research on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and he's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities. You have published quite prolifically on ancient Greek, Greek philosophy. Um, you have co-authored um, the book Power and Pleasure in 2001, also co-authored um, Reading Plato in Antiquity, and also written on Plato's um, a commentary on Plato's Republic, as well as on Plato's uh, Phaedrus. Is it true? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, ma making more books for people to read. All right. <laughs> Well, very rewarding, actually. I actually, Dirk, I try to to divide our our talk into two sections, and I, like um, the first section, I will try to devote. Actually, at least my questions will be focusing on uh, the general reception of Stoicism. Um, I start from the entry, and surprisingly enough for me, your entry in Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has also been translated into Persian um, and uh, as a book actually. Um, and uh, in the entry, I quote you that the um, Stoics did in fact hold, the em hold that emotions like fear and envy or impassioned sexual attachments or passions like love or anything whatsoever either were or aroused from false judgments and that the sage, a person who had attained moral and intellectual perfection, would not undergo them. So that's the end of quote. So the general question, what is the significance of Stoicism? Ah, the significance of Stoicism in that regard has been a very, very potent legacy. So, I mean, if you think about uh, views in the ancient world about the emotions, you can sort of locate them on a sort of spectrum of a divided self to a unified self. Mm -hmm. right? Think of Plato's view in the Republic as the, the sort of divided self. Mm -hmm. And this is surely true to some of the ways in which we experience emotions. Right? He talks about the, the thumetic or spirited part of the soul. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you see people doing silly things, right? Um, protesting against COVID restrictions by not wearing a mask, right? You feel this anger build up inside of you. How can they care so little about other people? Mm -hmm. And it feels like that anger is sort of alien. It's a force that is different from the rational mind and can overpower it. And Plato's theory sort of speaks to that, right? Because he compartmentalizes the soul into a rational part and an emotional part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As usual, Aristotle is the, the happy middle view, right? He thinks that emotions are partly made up out of judgments and partly out of feelings. Mm -hmm. And so in his very, very practical work called The Rhetoric, uh, which, which is meant to guide um, public speakers in, among other things, manipulating the audience's emotions, right. he tells them what these emotions are. And anger, he says, is a, a feeling of pain which is occasioned by the recognition of a conspicuous slight to you or your friends mm -hmm. together with a desire for revenge. And he even says there may be a further feeling of pleasure as that desire for revenge gives way to the imagining of you getting yours back. And that's why we say anger is sweet. Mm -hmm. right? So anger is a package deal then, right? It's a feeling, Plato was right about that, but it's a feeling that arises from a judgment. All right. Now the Stoics are on the opposite side of the dial and they say, oh yes, that's right. Judgment is in emotion, mm -hmm. but that's it, right? All right. Uh, an emotion 
like anger is in fact purely a species of judgment. Mm -hmm. We don't feel it like we feel other judgments that we make, mm -hmm. right? So um, I'm involved in a competition to, to tip or to predict the correct outcomes in our Australian Rules Football League. Mm -hmm. And so I very carefully this morning, I weighed up the odds of my team winning against their competition tonight and I made my prediction accordingly. That clearly feels like a judgment. You know, mm -hmm. I'm weighing up the evidence and thinking about what I should do. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like there's a decision to get angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, but the Stoics say, look, right. there's lots of decisions you make that you don't feel like making a decision. Right. What? Right. So they think that emotions operate roughly the same way that we think prejudice or sexism operates. Mm. Mm -hmm. right? So sure. to go back to this football example, right? You know, I've got a spare ticket to the football and I don't even think twice about offering it to one of my male friends. I don't consider that one of my female friends might like to go because mm. after all, Right. If I thought it through, I would realize, oh, yes, women like football, too. Mm. Right. But I prejudged the situation. I made a judgment without being fully conscious of what I was doing. Mm. And they think emotions are judgments like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's very interesting. I mean, of course, we'll go to that, um, to the social and political uh, ramifications of like this view. But I um, mean, back to the point that so there is a primary um, -ly made or defined um, distinction between emotion and feeling also there in a stoicism. Yeah. So, I mean, their word for emotion is a pathos. Mm. It's literally an undergoing right True. it's what happens to mm. you mm -hmm. and so when they say that the stoic sage or wise person is a parfe mm -hmm. that alpha there is a privative mm -hmm. like un they don't mean that you're apathetic in the mm -hmm. ordinary english sense they mean that you are a person to whom nothing merely happens mm -hmm. right um as a consequence, you don't, as it were, have these judgments dictated by the sort of clash between your circumstances and your not fully aware character. Rather, as a consequence of reflection on your character, you've taken a sort of active charge of the judgments that you endo endorse. Mm -hmm. and so there's a sort of process of bringing to consciousness uh, judgments that you're, as they suppose, are making, but aren't aware of that you're making. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's curious that um, cognitive behavioral therapy for depression often borrows from some of the sort of stoic spiritual exercises for bringing to consciousness mm -hmm. some of the implicit judgments that you're in fact making about the world and, and situations right, mm -hmm. right. Wow. interesting yeah yeah um well the, the second point in the first section of our talk um i've written is the is the relevance of um ethics and what these talks called uh, eudaimonia um i mean that's a bit um deceiving because aristotle also used that word and there seems to be some differences between Aristotelian grasp of eudaimonia and the Stoic grasp of it. Could you please elaborate on that? Of course. Let, let's begin. I mean, eudaimonia is everybody's term. Mm -hmm. And if you read English translations of ancient texts, I, I don't know what they do with the word in Persian translations, but in English it's often happiness. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's flourishing. And sometimes blessedness. And sometimes blessedness, though that's often, more often, makairos. Right. Um, the idea they've got in mind is a sort of 
objective condition of human well-being, mm -hmm. right? the sort of full realization of the human potential. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, it's more objective than some connotations of the English word happiness. All right. Because like, that seems like a feeling that kind of comes and goes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I think people convey the sense of what's going on with all these ancient Greek philosophers by treating uh, eudaimonia as synonymous with success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not success in the sort of conventional sense, right? You know, with the big house and the, the promotions and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. But success in terms of being a human. Mm -hmm. uh, fulfilling the human job. So the Stoics and the and Aristotle both agree that, right? Fulfilling the human job is the thing that we unconditionally aim at. That's eudaimonia. Mm -hmm. They just disagree about what it is, and they disagree about how fragile it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by fragile, I mean whether external circumstances can. Uh, derail your eudaimonia true mm, true i yeah. mean yeah yeah um uh there i mean but interestingly enough these these virtues i mean like these four cardinal virtues are prevalent in both aristotle and among stoics like this practical wisdom temperance justice and courage but it seems that for Stoics, it is all dependent on the knowledge that you have of all right. these cardinal virtues. That's right. But I mean, that's a sort of a natural consequence of their strongly monistic psychology. Mm. Right? Because Aristotle agrees with Plato that there is something like an irrational part of the soul. And the Stoics just categorically deny this. Mm -hmm. What we call irrationality is just reason behaving badly, right? True. You reason right down to the ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's take a phenomenon like desire, mm -hmm. right? You know, you see that beautiful Ferrari and you want it, right? You, you see your best friend's beautiful girlfriend and you want her, right? Mm -hmm. The Stoics think that even desire is a product of judgment, mm -hmm. right? What I've done, just as in the case of my prejudice or my fear, is I've implicitly endorsed the judgment that that's a good thing, worth having, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And as with the emotions, right? It's not as if they don't have some evidence on their side, because after all, sometimes in response to further information, our desires change, mm -hmm. right? But if our desires with just sort of brute animal psychic grabbings with no rational component to them, then why would the impact of further information make a difference to what we want? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just as we can be reasoned out of our anger sometimes, in the possession of further information, you realize the person didn't really mean that. So too, the Stoics infer from that that emotion has a rational component, indeed that it's exclusively rational. Mm -hmm. So too, from the fact that information has an impact on desire, they conclude that desire too is an act of reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just that we're not always very good at disciplining our reason. True, true. Um, yeah, interesting. I mean, it's interesting for me because I suppose it's also, it's also relatable to this difference you also made in that paper between happiness and flourishing because happiness so to say, is a kind of psychological and even transitory state of mind, while yes. flourishing can be seen as a kind of objective and permanent uh, feeling, or how do you think of it? I think that's absolutely correct. And I think there's something to that. I mean, 
we all have these friends who are enormous fun to be with. Um, they're exciting, they're daring. They do all the wrong things and you can tell that in the end, this is going to end badly. Mm. And they may think, I'm a happy guy. And you may think, well, yeah, you're fun to be with and you're having a good time, but this is not the pathway to flourishing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When your brother or your sister have their first child and you wish that child every happiness, mm -hmm. what you wish for them is not a sort of transitory, pleasant state of mind. Mm -hmm. You want them to be successful as humans, not to realize the sorts of talents that they're born with and live in a really excellently human kind of way. And that's more objective than just, you know, their state of mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. And it's also relatable to the feeling emotion difference. Like one is um, seen more as objective. The other is more your point of view, probably, or is more yeah, I think that's fair too. Um, we often fool ourselves, of course, too. And I mean, there's a reason why um, Sartre's little book, Sketch for a Theory of Emotions, mm -hmm. is actually heavily indebted to the Stoic theory of the emotions, right? Mm -hmm. He too thinks they're judgments. And the sort of interesting existentialist wrinkle that Sartre adds to this is, we often fool ourselves about whether about us lacking control here. Mm -hmm. I tell myself I couldn't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. But I, I put the responsibility elsewhere. And that element of bad faith is sort of the difference between that kind of objective look at our feelings. Mm -hmm. Did you have to get that angry under those circumstances? Mm -hmm. No, no. <laughs> But then, of course, you know, to let myself off the hook, I tell myself, oh, well, I'm just like that. Right. You know, mm -hmm. my, my father was a very angry guy, mm -hmm. too, and I just mm -hmm. inherited that. Mm -hmm. And the Stoics and Sartre say, no, you're letting yourself off the hook there. Mm. It's ultimately down to you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That comes very close to the prejudice you were talking about, this, this biased view that can sort of justify through the background. I come from that culture. I come from that family. I come from that father. I come from that religion. You know, like it's yes. also, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a reason why the Stoics seem to agree with the Cynic school who mm. seem to have perhaps coined the term cosmopolites, cosmopolitan. They think that your real citizenship is in a sort of a, a kingdom of rational beings, mm. right? And those who, in whom reason is properly trained, so that they actually live up to that potential form the only uh, genuine state that there is, mm -hmm. right? The difference between Greeks and Romans or Athenians and Spartans, this just drops away. Ultimately, you're all citizens of uh, the community of gods and wise people. Mm. Um. I mean, the, 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 in, the, in the chapter, in the short chapter that you generously uh, sent to me, uh, is, which is called Simple Living in History, I suppose, um, you're talking about what is a virtuous life from this sort of point of view and being like wise, courageous, self-controlled and just are attributes which might pass the stringent test what is this stringent test that you talk about? Okay, good. If you've had any acquaintance with um, sort of Immanuel Kant's little book called um, um, 
the groundwork, the metaphysics of morals. He's got this argument in there that um, the only good thing is the goodwill, mm -hmm. right? Because he considers, you know, pleasure, could that be the good? Well, he says, well, no, people take pleasure sometimes in hurting others, and that seems repugnant. So mm -hmm. pleasure can't be the good. He picks that line of reasoning up, I think, in some sense from the Stoics, who perhaps pick it up from a, a little read dialogue by Plato called the Euthydemus. Mm -hmm. In the Euthydemus, Socrates gets his conversational partner around to the position where he agrees that the only thing that is genuinely good is what's unconditionally beneficial to you, mm. right? So, you know, I've been a poor starving student and I've been a professor. Um, having money to buy a nicer quality wine is nice, mm. right? Is money unconditionally good? And the Stoics and Socrates said, no, of course not, because among other things, it can be used badly and it can be used in ways that don't genuinely benefit you, though you may think at the time that they do. And so the idea is that happiness in the sense of flourishing depends on the possession of that which is good. Since happiness is something that we pursue unconditionally, right? who does not want to flourish? The good has to be something that unconditionally benefits. But they think the only thing that passes that test is virtue. And the reason for that is it looks to them like a just sort of analytic truth, a truth of language, that since what is done cut our attain, or virtuously, or according to virtue, is done well, you protein. Mm -hmm. Those are just convertible for them. And of course, what's done well is done successfully. And what is happiness but success at the human job? So this just looks like a strict entailment to them. Mm -hmm. And they think, well, virtue unconditionally benefits because there's no circumstance mm -hmm under which I would want to act unsuccessfully. Right? Yeah. Who wants to be foolish? Who wants to be cowardly? Who wants to be lacking in self-control? Right? But I can imagine situations in which I'd be better off being poor. Yeah. <laughs> Since virtue is the only thing that passes that stringent goodness test, the Stoics suppose that it's both a necessary and a sufficient condition for happiness, mm -hmm. QED. Mm -hmm. And in this regard, they set themselves in opposition to Aristotle, who's strongly tempted by this line of argument, but he's also someone who has a great deal of respect for common sense. And common sense says, if you know, you're king of Troy like Priam, and you see one of your sons sort of mess up and bring home this strange woman. And this causes these crazy Greeks to turn up on your doorstep and lay siege to your city and destroy it and kill all 50 of your children and lay waste to your city. That virtuous or not, that's bad enough that you're not flourishing. Not? So Aristotle seems to give in to common sense that there can be circumstances in which he, what he calls the externals bad luck, um, lack of noble birth, not being good looking, because being good looking is very important to the Greeks. Uh. But these things can um, spoil our happiness, our flourishing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, 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 but sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Dirk. Um, but interestingly enough, um, uh, health is also defined as an external yeah. factor. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's also defined as a, it can, I mean, you have an example that's, that's interesting. You have this example of this uh, soldier being conspired uh, by, by, by this Nazi um, uh, SS. Uh, and I mean, 
when he is arrested, if he is ill or if he is not healthy enough, he might have more chance of survival. Or, yeah, well, he certainly won't be called upon to do the evil deeds that he's required to do. I mean, the example is actually a stoic one. Right? If you are ill and you are commanded by a tyrant to do something shameful, uh, you can't do it. Mm. Right, so the example is in fact theirs. Now, I mean, it's, it's true that we think that there can be flourishing lives in the absence of perfect health. Mm. Right? I mean, if we concentrate on, as it were, um, sort of intellectual flourishing, right? There's a sort of realization of the full philosophical mind. You might think that the late Professor Hawking, right, has a flourishing intellectual life. But Aristotle's view is, well, look, his disability may mar his blessedness, mm -hmm. his makairos. And the Stoics are just not having a bar of that. If he's intellectually and morally excellent, he is, as they suppose, as happy as Zeus himself. Well, so this is the sharp dividing line, right? The Stoics have got themselves a wonderfully consistent theory. They seem to have lots of answers for lots of things, but it drives them to conclusions that I think are in tension with our common ways of thinking. Mm. And when they see that conflict, they say, well, too bad for common sense. Mm -hmm. Aristotle sees that conflict and says, hmm, maybe time to qualify the theory a bit. Mm. They're very different kinds of philosophers, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Um, um, I suppose just in order to, um, in order to make the difference between what Stoics think of virtue and what is defined in history of philosophy as arete, mm -hmm. uh, you also make some comments which might be interesting for the audience. I mean, especially because you're referring also to self-sacrifice. Um, yeah, yeah, because I mean, this goes back to this sort of connection that we, we drew between doing things cat aretain or virtuously mm -hmm. and doing them successfully. Mm -hmm. But ordinarily, we think there's a tension between virtue and happiness. All right. Uh, my friend is feeling depressed and I really should spend some time with her. But when she's like this, it really brings me down. But it's the virtuous thing to do for a friend. Sigh. Right. The idea that there is an incompatibility between virtue and happiness is one that doesn't compute for the ancient Greeks, mm -hmm. right? or at least not for those like Aristotle and the Stoics who try to argue that virtue is an essential or the only component in a happy life. Right? And they're relying on that kind of analytic connection there. One of the nice features of the Stoic view is they've got this idea of things that are uh, oikeion or appropriate to you, right? So while health and wealth are not good in the sense that they're essential components of happiness, given an opportunity to, to do things that will make me healthy as opposed to things that will make me unhealthy, of course, it's more rational to choose the healthy ones. Right? And until in the absence of further information, that's what nature dictates. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that nature dictates is that while I have a sort of affinity with health, 
I also have a certain sort of affinity with you because mm. we're both rational creatures. Mm. And if it comes down to a choice between a course of action that promotes my health or a course of action that promotes your health, mm. it's not a foregone conclusion that I should choose mine. Mm. For both of these things have an affinity with me. They're wikeon, they, they belong with me. They're, they're part of my household, mm. they're family. Mm. Right? Mm. Interesting, yeah. Um, and this notion of a sort of universal brotherhood mm. of rational beings is, I think, one of the sort of interesting features of the Stoic theory of virtue when it gets married to that question of mm. who is the self? Who mm. are you really? Mm. Right? You're a rational creature. And I'm a rational creature. And this makes us brothers under the skin. And for that reason, they're inclined to think that if I do the virtuous thing in spending time with my friend who's depressed, this is not a contest, as it were, between my happiness and virtue. I just need to get an appropriate view about the value of that excellent friendly action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. There's not a real incompatibility between my flourishing and my virtuous action. In fact, there is an exact overlap. But I may fail to see that from my ignorant point of view because mm -hmm. I haven't got my head straight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, what's interesting is that the I mean, aside from judging things as good or bad, they also have a quite wide and vast category called preferred indifferences. What yeah. are they? Those are those things that I said, you know, sort of nature tells you they're your friends, mm. right? They belong with you. So here, I think they're probably distinguishing themselves again from their close competitors, the cynics. Mm -hmm. right, so the cynics see the, the sorts of things that common sense tells us are part of success, mm -hmm. you know, reputation, wealth, so on and so forth. And the cynics agree with the Stoics that nothing other than virtue seems to be good and nothing other than vice is bad. And they say, well, the rest of it is conventional nonsense. Mm -hmm. I've got no more reason to acquire enough money to buy a house than I do like Diogenes of Sinope to live in a barrel mm -hmm. in the street. Right? Everything except virtue is irrelevant. And the Stoics aren't willing to go that far. They'll say, well, look, it's irrelevant to your flourishing, but of course you live with other human beings and we can't all of us be living in barrels in the streets. Mm -hmm. And the sorts of things that common sense tell us are worth going for, like health and security and a place to live, these are at least conditionally worth going for. Mm -hmm. right? So when I'm trying to explain um, stoic happiness seeking to my students, uh, I'll use sporting examples because we're in Australia and sport is God. Right? Mm. <laughs> so you think about uh, at the Commonwealth Games in, in Queensland a couple of years back, um, there were um, Australian runners on the women's team who, you know, had a chance of finishing higher. But there was uh, a woman, a competitor, I th think from Ghana, who had not had enough fluids and it was a very, very hot day and she was becoming disoriented and couldn't find her way to the finish line. Uh -huh. They stopped and helped her across uh -huh. and surrendered several places in doing so. Uh -huh. So go back to things that are conventionally thought worth going for and the sense in which they're conditional. Mm -hmm. They decided that the conventional good of winning 
in this case, had to give way. It wasn't to be pursued unconditionally. What was to be pursued unconditionally was good sportsmanship. Mm -hmm. Right? And I think of the, the stoic wise person in much the same way. The pursuit of the preferred indifference, mm -hmm. health, wealth, friendship, reputation. Mm -hmm. These are, as it were, the, the sporting contest, which provides the sort of rules and framework, the equipment for demonstrating good sportsmanship. Mm -hmm. But what I really want is not to win, not to have the medal. What I really want is good sportsmanship. Mm -hmm. And sometimes competing honorably gets you the prize. Right. Mm -hmm. And when it doesn't, they suppose that uh, the wise person feels no conflict and no regrets. Mm -hmm. If I had it to do over again, I would still help her find her way to the finish line. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, sort of stoic ways of thinking about this tend to be very, very popular among sort of elite sports people and above and, and the military. And soldiers, and, uh, yeah. Uh, and it's no surprise that mm -hmm. stoicism was um, popular among the sort of Roman elite and the senators mm -hmm. right, because they felt this coincided with their deep sense of, mm -hmm. of honor and duty to Rome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's high time I started uh, um, asking some questions and in relation to global pandemic. I mean, uh, you also sent me this article from Brigitte uh, Delaney. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. I, I, I suppose no. It was in this in this um, in this file you sent me. I found it actually. I started reading that. That was quite uh, interesting and rewarding. It was published in um, 17th of March 2020, like four months ago almost. And yes. there, um, I mean, it's, it's like stoicism is defined as a good cure for the COVID lockdown blues, as you call it. Um, in times like this, it's easy. I mean, as we have also experienced uh, throughout the world, that everybody spirals to anxiety, into anxiety. Uh, people are feeling adrift. Rather less. Yes. Uh, it was um, it was the experience we all shared, and it seems that stoicism, uh, as is defined as staying calm in adversity, has something to do with this pandemic. Can also offer something. Can contribute uh, something to us. Although it's been defined as having a stiff upper lip and uh, having emotional reserve, but then uh, do you think of this pandemic? as a test for us from Stoic yeah, I think that's I think that's really quite good. Um, I'm not sure whether you've ran across the term yet, but I read something or other in, was it in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago, about this bad habit that people have acquired during the pandemic uh, that the author calls doom scrolling. Mm -hmm. right, sort of scrolling through your social media feed, uh, looking at all the stories about how bad things are going mm. and doing it obsessively and finding that you can't quite stop yourself mm. from looking at how horrible things are. Mm. Right? And that's the kind of, that seems to me to be the kind of thing that the Stoic Chrysippus describes when he talks about what's wrong with the emotions. You know what? He thinks they're judgments, but they can get out of control. Like uh, you start running downhill on a very, very steep hill and eventually you can't stop. Mm. Right? So too with doom scrolling, right? we start uh, obsessing over these things and we lose our capacity to, to withdraw and gain an appropriate perspective. Now, one of the things that I 
was a little critical of Bridget Delaney's article about was, I think she hasn't come to terms with the um, full cost mm -hmm. of the Stoic view that goes with those emotional benefits. Huh? God forbid that you or any of your listeners should lose a loved one in this pandemic. But of course, plagues and the death of loved ones was a feature of ancient life. And the Stoic Epictetus gives the aspiring Stoic student, as it were, sort of emotional exercises, right? Mm -hmm. Take your take your favorite cup, right, that you drink your afternoon tea out of and remind yourself what it is. Mm -hmm. It's only a cup and cups break. And if this one breaks, you won't be upset. Mm -hmm. And he says in the next sentence, remind yourself what your wife and child are, that they are mortal. And if they break, you will not be upset. The question I think I have for people who suppose that stoicism is a good way of gaining control and gaining perspective and not being upset by events in the pandemic is that if you really absorb the full weight of their philosophical views, I think it is hard to suppose that your relation to your loved ones can remain exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, would I be better placed to deal with the death of my wife in a pandemic if I could regard her in the same realistic way that I regard my favorite teacup? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. Would my relationship to her be the relationship of love that I think that it is? Maybe not, mm -hmm. right? And so I guess I think, um, you know, people who are taking stoicism for the COVID lockdown blues should read very, very carefully the ingredients on the bottle right? If you're going to take this because you're upset, make sure that you know what's in it. Right? And of course, the Stoics themselves wouldn't think of this philosophy as, you know, uh, a little helper that you take when times are tough. Mm -hmm. They believe this not because they believe that it will help you. They believe it because they believe it's true. Mm. And they think that as philosophers, that's your first question. Mm -hmm. Not will it make me feel better, but is it true? Mm. Right? And that seems to me to be the difference between sort of casual self-help books and philosophy. Mm. All right, the ancients are firmly of the view that there could be nothing that is really good for you to believe, which is nonetheless false. So you have to do the philosophy first. You have to look at the arguments and say, is it really plausible that mm -hmm. the only good thing is virtue? Mm -hmm. So these two points that... Um that uh, Delaney highlights in, in her article in Guardian, uh, which are like, the first one is that we are all connected. And the second one was that this uh, negative visualization, do you define them as a kind of self-help approach or a philosophical approach in that regard? Well, I mean, Ms. Delaney is writing for a general audience for the Guardian and you know, when I teach the history of philosophy to my students, I explain to them there's sort of two kinds of historians of philosophy. 
uh, think about the uh, think about the Indiana Jones character in the terrible series of silly Hollywood movies, and then think about the character that Sean Connery plays as his father. Uh, Sean Connery wants to go into the ancient sites and see all of the artifacts and record their positions and make inferences about the ancient culture, right? To understand it. Mm -hmm. And Indy wants to race in and, you know, grab the skull of doom and take it away to save the world. Mm -hmm. right? As a historian of philosophy, I'm Sean Connery, right? You know, I want to understand, I'm bald like him too. I, I want to understand these things fully in context. Uh, and only after I've, as it were, sort of assessed whether they, the meaning of these things in their original setting can still have meaning for us. Mm. Only then will I decide whether it's worth trying to save the world with this. Mm. And, um, you know, my own thought on this is Stoicism is potent stuff, but I suspect that Aristotle is in fact closer to the truth. Mm while our flourishing is mostly up to us, things like pandemics can come along and those do indeed threaten our ability to live fully human and fully flourishing lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means that not all of these things are under our control and the Stoics are wrong about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's worrying. It would be one. nice if it were yeah. true, mm -hmm. but I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Are you ready to sign on for, you know, a full dose of stoicism? No, no. I mean, just, I had actually, I had something, I mean, um, like Marcus Aurelius as an example of these, uh, mm -hmm. like this Roman emperor, he also lived through this Antonin plague, if I'm not wrong, yes. pandemic that wiped out uh, one third of the population. And also we have, um, we have uh, Seneca himself who lived through the time of this part, like, like Nero, like Caligula. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, I, I, I actually was, I, was, I was about to ask you as perhaps my last question about this social political facets of it because i suppose it's sort of i mean it's very it's very neutral i mean you can't say if stoicism helps you politically and socially when you're living under despots for example or under pandemic like now yeah it's it's very neutral i don't know really how to side with that i think that's probably right and it's because there's this sort of tension between their cosmopolitanism mm. and their community in a kingdom of rational beings mm. the first citizens of which are the gods because right? they're, they're fully rational and I think looking at other human beings as akin to me and part of my family, but with the idea that I should be able to sort of calmly contemplate mm -hmm. their deaths, either through a pandemic or perhaps as in the case of Brutus, also a Stoic philosopher, at my hand, if I think that killing Caesar is what Rome requires, mm. <laughs> right? Um, I think Stoicism leaves us as individuals with a with not much to set a sort of moral compass on, right? Mm. Be excellent, mm -hmm. be courageous, right? Be wise, be self-controlled in relation to what? Mm. 
things that I, at the end of the day, must say don't matter are like teacups. Mm. Right? It's like that stark choice in Sartre's existentialism as a humanism, right? Mm. Should I should I stay at home with my aged mother and care for her, join the resistance and fight the Nazis? Mm. And Sartre says, well, look, there's no God, there's no nothing written in the stars to tell you what to decide here, right? What does courage or in Sartre's case, what does authenticity require here? And the voice that comes back from the void, mm what you say it requires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. It's fascinating stuff. It's, mm. it's part of the reason I've written about it, but you can write about a lot of things and think they're interesting to think through. And at the end of the day, think, I understand the fascination, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure this is true. Huh. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Derek, do you have any, any last remark, like generally for the audience? Um, a bit of advice if you're interested in Stoicism. Uh -huh. um, the ancient works that are most accessible to us are the works that are least theoretical. Uh -huh. So you mentioned Marcus really Seneca. Um, their writings are mostly about how you would internalize Stoic theory and live it. But they're not themselves theoreticians, or at least we don't have writings from them that, that do that. The problem with the theoretical end of Stoicism is that the first three heads of the Stoic Academy wrote heaps but not a single work has survived. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to see what the theory looks like, you've got to put it together from fragments and reports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the best text for doing that is by A. A. Long and D. N. Sedley, called The Hellenistic Philosophers, Volume 1, from Cambridge University Press, published in 1987, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, it's enormous fun to read Marcus Aurelius because, I mean, he really comes off the page as, as a person. Because mm. after all, what you're doing is you're reading his notes to himself. Mm. But you'd be hard-pressed to figure out from reading Marcus why he thinks the things he thinks, what, the, what he thinks the arguments are. Uh, and, and that's just one of the sort of bits of historical tough stuff about studying Stoicism. It's why things like, you know, that Stanford Encyclopedia entry on Stoicism, I, I hope, are helpful to orienting people to the texts that are accessible and available to a general public, like Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, it's one of those historical bits of bad luck. Mm -hmm. Some books survive and some don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it was. I mean, the peer piece here entry and stoicism in Stanford's Encyclopedia of Philosophy is absolutely illuminating and, 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 and user friendly. I mean, it was a stoic style of writing about stoic. I, I really appreciate that. And I, I should also thank you very much on behalf of uh, the Iranian audience, myself for the time and effort you made into this uh, nice and kind discussion. And it is, it is my absolute pleasure. Um, the, uh, assuming that it in fact happens, the World Congress of Philosophy is supposed to be coming in Australia, to Australia in 2022. All right, All right. great. So perhaps um, if the world is back to normal again, I will see you in Melbourne in a couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And looking forward to meeting you in person. And if you happen to come to Berlin, of course, you're all welcome. 
I hope to. I'm I'm in for a couple of European fellowships for next year, but we will see what happens. Okay, great, great. I, in in the meantime, I will try and remain a parfait. <laughs> we all have to actually. <laughs> Derek. Um, all right. Yeah, thank you, Derek, and I I wish you. A, what time is it now there? Is... Oh, it's just gone 8 p.m. in the evening oh, on right. a cold winter night. <laughs> True. Yeah. Time for a warm glass of wine. And All dinner. right. Yeah. Yeah. Perfectly. Yeah. And I wish you a happy and also flourishing evening. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Thank you.